Hey, thanks for being here. This is Played Forward. Real people, real stories. The struggle to play it forward. Episode number 528 is with Alan Cozen and Adrian Sinclair, authors of the book The McCartney Legacy, Volume 1, 1969 through 73. That right there was a growing period for Paul McCartney. So many people associated with him, you know, 100% all out Beatles, but I think he was, he was at that little seed that was in the soil about ready to pop as a solo performer. That's probably true, although, you know, at the time he was so depressed uh, in the aftermath of the Beatles breakup that it took him a while to sort of get cranked up again. But once he did, I mean, you know, maybe I'm amazed on the first album is, you know, he's back totally uh, to speed. And, uh, you know, and then what followed over the period we cover uh, sees consistent growth until you get to Band on the Run, which was really a triumph. Oh, my God. It's just those early days. See, I the thing is, is that I'm at the age where I, I didn't get to experience the Beatles, but I got to experience Paul McCartney. And, and so when someone told me he was part of the Beatles, I, I, I was that kid that it was like, nah, he's Paul <laughs> McCartney. <laughs> That's great. For for you to go in and to do the research that you did in this book in volume one, I mean, how do you how do you keep it 100 percent uniquely your own? That's a great question. Yeah, I mean, we were really fortunate whilst making this book that back in 2016, when we were interviewing uh, Denny Sywell, who was a, a former drummer with Wings, uh, that, that Denny volunteered to us at the end of an interview um, his uh, session diaries and also the small small diaries that his wife Monique used to keep and they weren't detailed diaries they didn't say oh you know fell out with Paul today or anything like that they were they were just a log of what was going on in their lives but what that did give us was the you know a, a first hand undisputed timeline for this period and really that formed the backbone of a lot of the um, other research that we did and uh, yeah we when I mean, we put this book together over a period of eight years so wow. you know that that one discovery that that those diaries you know comes together with tens of thousands of other things that go into you know what people will hold in their hands when they walk into bookstores today see that's one of those things I, I truly believe in the in the dear future reader kind of process of, of writing because when, when you step into those diaries and stuff like that he wasn't speaking to his moment of now dear future reader he was putting it out there for you guys to find <laughs> he didn't know it at the time. Exactly. But, uh, yeah. I mean, I mean that, that's that's one of the things that I that I learned about Mark Twain is that you know when he wrote his autobiography, it was it was not to be released until fifty years after his death, and and mm -hmm. he he was speaking to the next generations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. We we think we're speaking to you know really a, a long future in which people will be listening to Paul's music and will want to know what went into it and that's what we were really looking for you know how the songs were made what inspired them uh how did he put them together in the studio what were the other in mu musicians contributions uh what were the engineers contributions really everything that we could find about the music of this period and i i think you know, i think it's fair to say we cover every single song that he did <laughs> during this period and and that's how we'll continue we hope through the rest of the series yeah i mean we even put together a, a little playlist um so you can actually uh, listen along with the book and you and you know i'm guessing that some people maybe won't won't have heard some of paul's lesser known songs from this period so we hope that by the time they've read the book they'll maybe have some new favorites yeah because you know this this time period here is probably one of the last great moments of people listening to full albums i mean because i mean the people when when they got the album they i mean they could break it down they and or we would listen to fm radio they've dropped the needle on that thing at midnight and we would get the full album but we never knew the stories until the di the jock on the air said something about it right right yeah i remember those days <laughs> and, and and you depended on radio people to do that but but you know for a radio guy the only thing we had was joel whitburn i'm, I'm so jealous of this generation that they've got you guys bringing this story forward thank you <laughs> Yeah, you know, it was uh, it, it it was a lot of work, and we feel that it um, paid off because we. Uh, we basically wrote the story and I, on one hand I want to say we wrote the story that we wanted to write but we really didn't have preconceptions we just wanted to find out everything we could find out 
and use that as the basis of the book. And uh, we think it, it came together really well and, uh, you know, really sort of grateful to the people we interviewed. And, and uh, you know, Adrian's research was incredible, uh, you know, for, for background research in the, the British Library. He, he sort of sorted through all every publication where Paul went someplace and was mentioned. Uh, so we've got, you know, little newspapers from Scotland <laughs> and, you know, uh, things that haven't been looked at for 50 years and uh, and helped us sort of reconstruct a lot of detail. And it re I think that really helped us, um, you know, explore some of the songs that maybe people think they know really well right. uh, and uncover the stories behind them in, in greater detail. You know, so there's there's things like, you know, we've all heard Band on the Run, but I don't think a lot of people will be aware of the fact that that was really inspired by a business meeting, of all things, um, and, and something that George Harrison said to Paul during a business meeting. So, um, so yeah, I, I think anybody who picks up the book will definitely learn something new about songs they know and, and songs that they don't know. Well, Band on the Run, you, you, you explained it inside the pages that, that you know, it came with a lot of challenges. And so now when I listen to the song, it's, it's, I've got a completely different view of, of, of the experience. Yeah, I mean, talk about going through the mill when they were putting an album together. Uh, you know, on the eve of the recording sessions, two, of, two members of Wings leave the band. Um, you know, within a few days of each other. And then they jet off to uh, Lagos in Nigeria to a recording studio that's not even been properly built when they arrive. Uh, and then they go through, you know, this whole um, traumatic experience really over a period of two, three weeks in Nigeria where, you know, Paul and Linda are held up at knife point, Paul mm. collapses in the studio one day. I mean, really, they, they, they did go through it. But what came out of that period is arguably you know paul's greatest solo record of all time i think commercially it certainly is most successful because he's so positive today i mean he's just a ball of energy at all times do you think that the average person sees the hits but not the misses and what this book says hey he's a guy he's a real human being and he has had some misses in his life Right, you know, and there were things that that you know, even the band was not crazy about doing, like Mary had a little lamb. But you know, we also try to, you know, we try to give actually both perspectives on that. You know, so Henry McCulloch's frustration at it, uh, you know, standing there during filming of a, a promo or a, a, a TV special where they're going to do Mary had a little lamb and thinking how much longer is this going to go on um but also paul's perspective of you know he has a daughter named mary and this song was something that he put together really for her and uh you know it has turned up on compilations of children's records and it you know it has a life of its own that's useful and we as sort of you know adult sophisticated consumers of music may not list it among our favorite paul mccartney songs but it you know it has a place what was he thinking when he put together Uncle Albert? I, I, as you know, growing up through the through the ranks of radio, I always thought that that was his his hanging on to the Beatles because of what they did with Sgt. Pepper. But at the same time, I felt like that he was really exploring that new level of storytelling. Yeah, well, that song came together in various different pieces. So yeah. there was a section of it called Gyps to Get Around, which was basically just a little ditty that he played for his kids when they were. Um, you know, around the, his farm in Scotland. Um, and then the two other portions of it, Uncle Albert was written for an uncle he had, who he had fond memories of uh, from his childhood. Uh, an uncle he used to kind of climb on tables during uh, family get togethers when he'd had one too many. And, and he rem remembered him fondly, so he captured him in song. And then the Admiral Halsey side of it um, came together really during a trip to Scotland during the summer of 1970, um, where, the, where the family uh, took a trip from Campbelltown uh, all the way to the northernmost tip of Scotland. And then they went beyond. They got on a boat and took a trip to the Orkneys and the Shetland Islands. Um, and we think that uh, Uncle Albert, you know, this kind of maritime adventure was probably based on that and, and originally was probably titled um, For the skipper that, that took them across to the Orkney Islands. Um, but in the end, he substituted the skipper's name uh, for a name that he plucked from a film that was out around that time called Tora, 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 yes. uh, which featured um, Admiral Halsey played by, I think, James Whitmore. 
So, you know, he, he shows this great capacity and he still has it to this day. Uh, I, I always say he's like a musical magpie. He plucks <laughs> all of these incredible things from the world around him and he wraps them all up together, you know, in, in melody and, uh, and poetry and presents them to the world in, in these incredible songs that we all know. As that kid, I, of course, I had the Wings poster all over my, my bedroom wall and things like that. But as much as Paul McCartney was the superstar, I was also very much attracted to the skills of Denny Lane. Was Denny his, Paul's brand new John Lennon? Oh, I don't know about that. Um, Dick Costenny didn't really contribute that much in the way of songwriting. He had uh, you know, a handful of songs across the entire period of Wings, um, including one on Band on the Run that was a collaboration with Paul. Um, and a collaboration in, in the way that Paul sometimes did with John, where they each had part of a song, or Danny had a, an unfinished song and Paul finished it off. Um, I, I think it might be saying too much for Danny, Danny to, to say uh, his new John Lennon, but he knew Denny from way back in the Beatles era when uh, Denny was still in the Moody Blues and they toured uh, second build to the Beatles and also Brian Epstein managed them briefly. So they knew each other for quite a long time before Denny came uh, to join Wings. What have you guys learned from this project? I mean, like you said, you invested eight years of your life into this. I mean, here we go. Now now the, the, the wilderness belongs to us because you've really you Re relinquish the book mm -hmm. yeah it's a really interesting question i think what we've learned is uh <laughs> is that yeah eight, eight years is a very long time um i i think for you know during that period you know you, you start off with the skeleton of of the book and then you start fleshing it out and the more we fleshed it out the more we the more the you know the man we began, began to understand and you know how his uh creative engine works and what makes him tick so i'd say yeah over over that kind of eight year period um, you know, we, we really began to understand more of, um, you know, of, of what makes him tick creatively. One of the I think, as Adrian said, you know, the magpie thing, um, you know, and that's not insignificant because everybody in a way is a magpie. You know, they 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 bank their experiences and sometimes do things with them. But not everybody has, you know, becomes Paul McCartney and writes those songs that he wrote. And uh, and that's really a, a kind of a special quality. Yeah, I mean, Paul, Paul, for me, is his life is like the ultimate rags to riches story. I mean, this is a guy who woke, who, who grew up in social housing in Liverpool. Um, so, he, you know, he, he wasn't from a wealthy family. And now he's this incredible superstar. Um, so, you know, I, I think it's just such a phenomenal tale, um, Paul's entire life, really, the Beatles and beyond. Is it an addiction to creativity? Because Paul didn't mind writing music for other artists as well. I mean, he was always and still is creating music over and over and over, even at today's age. Oh, yeah. I mean, the, that that's the most difficult thing with our project, I guess, is that Paul's a man that just doesn't stop. You know, he's 80 years old now and he's still going strong. So you know, a lot of people uh, ask us, um, you know, what's your end game, guys? This only covers a five year period of his life. How many books are you going to put together? Because, uh, you know, keeping uh, a tally of this incredible cr uh, creative body of work that Paul's put together as a solo artist is such a phenomenal job. But, um, you know, it's one we're relishing taking on. The name of the book is The McCartney Legacy, Volume 1. Hopefully there's going to be several more volumes because I want to know uh, the Paul McCartney story with his connection with, with Brian Ray. Because Brian, oh my God, you get him on Paul McCartney, you're going to hear some incredible stories. Ah, uh, yeah. Yeah, no, we can't wait to get to that part. That will be in, I guess, volume four. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, because because there, there's so much that we want to learn. I mean, I, I, when, when Howard Stern gets weak in the knees when he's talking to Paul McCartney, I live for that moment because he's sitting there in front of Paul. You guys are writing about Paul. I mean, you, you are so close and so intimate with the story and the actuality. Yeah, you know, um, and this is what we wanted. I mean, I've been a, a Beatles fan all my life and uh, going back to when they were a current thing. Um, Adrian is a lot younger, and so he sort of grew up with Paul McCartney mm -hmm. being, uh, you know, Paul McCartney and not, not an, an ex-Beatles so much. Um, you know, although that's, you know, Adrian's a, a big Beatles guy too. But uh, so, yeah, you know, we uh, this is like, 
this is sort of the dream job in a way, you know. I mean, I I, I worked mostly as a classical music critic at the New York Times, but was always covering whatever I could in terms of the Beatles. You know, I left the Times in at the end of 2014, which is about when we started, or by then we were already talking about this. Uh, and so to, you know, be spending the next period and, and as far as as far as I can see the future periods doing this and, and, and you know, working in Paul's creative life is, you know, is a dream. Can we officially say that the story of Yoko breaking up the Beatles is over with? I mean, because you discuss it in, in the book very clear that it's like, OK, let's move ahead of this and let's let's honor the moments. Yeah, I mean, it's ridiculous. She, has, she didn't break up the Beatles. And, and I think anybody serious about the Beatles knows that. Um, and yet you still run into it. You yeah. still run into it all the time. Um, but, you know, eventually I think maybe that will disappear because there's it, it, it's just stupid. <laughs> <laughs> but isn't that what the music yeah. industry is all about, though? Those those stupid moments? <laughs> Sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> so now, you when you, when you say that that you're critical of of classical music and things like that, I've always thought of Paul McCartney as being a Mozart or or a Bach or a Beethoven. Uh, yeah, I, I, I'm not sure I said it was critical of it so much as that I was I was a classical music reviewer, mm -hmm. you know, at, at, at the times. Um, you know, a lot of people say that, and, and Paul, of course, has a classical side, too, that will also be in volume three or four. I'm not sure where it'll fall, but he's he 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 really loves classical music and he has written a well three large classical pieces a lot of small classical pieces and uh and and there are classical things he's done that we haven't heard yet he, he wrote a guitar concerto i'd love to hear that mm -hmm. uh so yeah, you know, whether he's Mozart or, you know, it's it, it's a different era, it's a different style. But, uh, you know, Paul has, you know, he is an inspired guy. He has that, you know, that touch that comes from who knows where, yeah. you know. You can see, you know, like if you, if you watch Amadeus since you brought up Mozart, you know, and Paul has that uh, – There's in Amadeus, <laughs> yeah. Salieri, the other composer, talks about, you know, Mozart having the, the touch of God. And, you know, Paul has some of that too. So, you know, it's just a, a different uh, kind of music. But, yeah, I think you can make that case, and we're trying to. If if you were to sit down with him and just ask one question, where, where he wouldn't say, oh, I've answered that question several times, what would be that one question that he hasn't answered several times? Wow, that's a really interesting one. <laughs> <laughs> It's kind of funny because he has a lot of set pieces that he says all the time, uh, mm -hmm. you know, about dreaming yesterday and going vegetarian because he's seeing the gambling lambs. Um, and when I interviewed him when I was at the Times, I, you know, having read even by then before we started this pretty much every interview that I could find of him, I, I was determined to not ask questions that would allow him to do his set pieces. Yes. Um, but finding what it would be now, especially having read even more of his interviews, uh, you know, for us, I think because of the the depth that we've looked into and, and having read all those interviews, a lot of the questions that we might ask that he hasn't answered are just sort of technical questions like, you know, well, how did you do, you know, this guitar line? What yeah. did you use? What, you know, whatever for the, for the volumes going forward. Um, but even if we weren't to to be able to ask him those things, which seems likely because he doesn't like talking to biographers. Uh, <laughs> you know, we've talked to so many other people who were there and and can tell us what he did. So so there's that. I don't know. Do you have a question you would ask him? I can't, I can't think of anything. Yeah. No. <laughs> Congratulations on money. this. Yeah, isn't that the truth? I mean, and that's the thing about it. He, he's got so many answers for everything. Now, are we going to mm. wait eight more years for volume two? No, no. Okay, We're good. already at work on it. We've uh, got the research largely done, if not completely done, and uh, and it's we're writing it right now. I and I think it will be out maybe at the end of 2024. Well, then I expect to talk to you at the end of 2024. Mm -hmm. It's a date, <laughs> and we'll talk to you again. Yeah. Okay. You guys be brilliant today, okay? Okay, thanks. Thanks so much.